Hello again and welcome back to English Today. This is DVD 21 and the fourth DVD in your advanced level. And in this DVD, we'll start again with another two episodes of our story, That's Life. And then after that, in our special TV programs, our music expert will be talking about the Royal Opera House in London. And then our travel expert will be looking into volunteer holidays. Then, in the grammar section, we will look at ways of expressing your likes and dislikes. And we'll also study different ways of expressing feelings of regret. All right? So enjoy your viewing. Jack! Jack! I was waiting for you. Have you got a minute? Sure, Edward. What's up? You want to put some muscles in your film? Jack, you are quite a joker. I need some advice about a rather delicate matter. Well, it's about women. Oh, well, then you've come to the right person when it comes to women, in all modesty. I'm sort of an expert. Go ahead, shoot. But make it fast. I have to get to the gym. Oh, well, don't worry. It's like this. If a woman lets you mysteriously know that she's keen on you, and if you didn't expect it, but then you find that you don't mind the gesture. In fact, because of this, you find that you are becoming fond of her. And if she acts as if nothing has happened... Whoa, 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 whoa Edward. What are you getting at? I, I don't understand. It, is this a new idea for a film? Because if it is, you should think about rewriting this script. It seems very convoluted to me. Jack, stop joking. It's a serious matter. I, I just don't know how to behave. I, I can't stand this situation. Well... Okay. Let's take this from the top. So, a woman goes for you. However, she doesn't do it openly. But then she pretends as if nothing has happened. And, as far as I can tell, you don't dislike the idea. Have I got it? Exactly. Mm. What should I do? Well, the fact... Her behavior leads me to believe that she's fond of games. So, use that. Play the mysterious man. And then, surprise her with something special. You know, like, uh, take her out to dinner, or write her a poem, or... Send her some red roses. Women really go for that kind of thing. Oh, really? I got an idea. I'd really like to meet this mysterious woman. <laughs> what she sees in him is beyond me. <laughs> It what? Would you mind not watching the TV for a moment? I'd like to have a word with you. Why is it important, Alice? Chuck is on. The reality program about show business. You know I'm nuts for this show. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's about the only thing you go for. What's up, Alice? What's bothering you? Edward, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. It's just that... has something... What? I mean... anything particular happened recently? Oh, well, <laughs> if I have to tell you the truth, yes! Great! <laughs> so, what? So what? What are you getting at? Well, what did you think about it? Were you pleased by it? Oh, yes, very much, but why we are talking about such embarrassing things? Uh, well, I 
think you should talk about it, Edward. Once and for all. You think you know me. I don't, I'm not good with words. Well then, get into action. I think you've already waited long enough. Well, maybe you're right. I'm a class, aren't I, Alice? <laughs> oh, yes, but you can fix it. I'll surprise you. By the way, Alice, have you decided what are you going to wear for our date yet? Oh, our date? Are you serious, Edouard? Sure! Our date with Mr. Martin, the television producer. That date? Have you forgotten? No, don't worry. I haven't forgotten about it. for the ball, no one calls for the ball, Carney's slightly out of position, just snaps the ball and scores. <laughs> Hello again, and welcome back. Jack and Edward in that episode were talking about what they like doing and what they dislike doing. And in the English language, this is very interesting because there are different ways of describing what you like and what you dislike, different verbs, different phrases. And that's what I want to do with you now. I'm going to give you some examples in this little exercise. And if you listen carefully, you will notice how many different forms there are. It's like a little quiz. I'm going to talk to you about an animal, all right? I'm going to describe what this animal likes doing and dislikes doing. And then I want you to try and guess what the animal is, all right? So are you ready? Listen carefully. Well, these animals are keen on eating big animals. They're keen on eating big animals. They're fond of basking in the sun, in the long grass. So they're fond of lying, basking in the sun, in the long grass. They really love running at top speed. They love running at high speed, okay? They can't stand, they can't stand getting wet. Like when it rains, they can't stand getting wet. Mm. They can't bear being disturbed when they're eating. They can't bear being disturbed when they're eating. Another thing, they don't mind the presence of man, but at a distance, all right, okay. They dislike being close to lions, to lions. Dislike being close to lions. They hate being disturbed when they are with their cubs, with their babies, okay, their babies, their cubs, cubs. As animals, they don't go in much for making noise, they don't go in for making noise, they're silent, they're quiet. And for them it's all right to eat only twice every four days, so once every two days. They don't have to eat every day. So, have you guessed the animal? <laughs> it's a cheetah. Now remember that in English, a cheetah is not Mr. Monkey. A cheetah in English is the fastest animal in the world. It's the cat, the wild cat with dots. That's the cheetah. And that's what I was describing, all right? Now let's look more closely at the language that I used. So if we are talking 
about likes, these are the possibilities. You can use the verb to be keen on. Now notice that these verbs are followed by the gerund form because we have a preposition. So, I'm keen on skiing. Keen on plus gerund means I'm enthusiastic about it. I'm fond of, I'm fond of learning English. Same meaning, okay? It means I like it very much. Keen on, fond of, plus gerund. You can have the negative too. I'm not so fond of going to the cinema alone, for example. Now, what about the negative? I can't stand is the same as I hate. Very, very common use, this. I can't stand getting up early in the morning, Gerund. I can't stand getting up early in the morning. We also say, I can't bear. Look at the pronunciation. I can't bear, all right? Getting up early in the morning. I can't bear drinking beer, for example. You can say, I really love doing something. I really love playing tennis. Um, now, you can say, I don't mind doing something. Now, I don't mind means I don't particularly like it. I don't particularly dislike it. So it's okay, it's nothing special for me. So I don't mind playing tennis, but it's not my favorite sport, all right? We also have the verb dislike. I dislike playing tennis, all right? So see how many they are, it's really interesting. Another one which is much less known, but we use it quite a lot, is to go in for. Listen to this. I don't go in for watching documentaries. I don't go in for playing tennis. Again, which means I'm not interested in it. All right? Another thing is, well, it's all right. Again, this is non-committal. It's all right playing tennis, but it's not my favorite sport, all right? And then something similar to all right is it's okay. Well, it's okay eating rice, but I'm not really very enthusiastic about it. So you see how many different examples we have to describe like and dislike in English. And again, these, these are things that we use every day, so you need to practice them often. So, it's okay learning English and you are excellent at doing it and I like seeing your progress, <laughs> okay? Great, well, that's this lesson and we'll see you again in the next one. All right, bye for now. Great. This spot should work well. Maybe here would be better. And I'll put the card here, next to this. Uh, let's give it a quick once over again. And I should have done this long ago. Now, I can't wait any longer. Listen to my poetry, written especially for you. You are perfume, the color of all flowers, the breath and scent of the sea, the warming strength of the sun. You, the shining star that lights my life. Who knows if she'll like it? What about these roses? Will she like them? And what if she makes fun of me? Perhaps uh, I shouldn't have listened to Jack, but of course, of course. It 
makes no sense to go on as if nothing has happened. Somebody has to take the first step. I'll await you tomorrow night here in the living room. When everyone is asleep, we'll be able to be alone, finally, alone. Okay, that is done. There's nothing more to do now but wait. I'll be home soon. Thank God Alice won't be here at least for two hours. And Jack is at the gym, yes. I calculate everything perfectly. Now it's time for me to leave as well. I don't want them to see me here. Mm -hmm. Here she is. Hi, it's time to go. Excellent. Great, Edward. The moment of truth approaches. They'll never call me an amateur again. Right, fine. Bye-bye. Oh, is the door open? Bloody cat's Oh, what are these? For me? Oh, they're beautiful. I wonder who sent them. Oh, what poetry. Who could have written it? No, Anne. What are you thinking? Now, don't be silly. It can't have been Jack. Oh, my God. But then again, he's the only person I can imagine who would have written such lovely poetry. And... Oh, my God. Oh, what if it were Jack? Now that Sharon is out of the picture and... Would have ever thought that that one day oh Jack Hi Anne. Hi Alice. My aren't we feeling chirpy today? Yes, we are feeling chirpy. I've just received a mysterious and completely unexpected surprise. So, what is it? What's all the suspense for? Oh, I'm sorry, Alice. I'd like to keep it a secret for the time being. There's something I have to check up on first. But don't worry, I'll tell you soon enough. Now, why don't you tell me how's it going with Edouard? By the look on your face, I would guess things aren't going very well. You said it. A complete and utter disaster. I should never have written that card. Why? What's the matter? That's the problem. Nothing has happened. Edouard acts as if he'd never read that card. And yet I know he read it. I'm absolutely certain of it. Why are you so sure? Well, he told me in no uncertain terms. I fished around, vaguely, and he admitted that something strange had happened, and he also said that he was very pleased. And then nothing. No words, no actions. At this point, I think he was referring to something else entirely. Or else, I just have to accept the fact that he isn't interested in me. Oh, don't get depressed, Alice. If you want my opinion, I think you should have told him in person. Face to face is always better than playing games. At any rate, you've still got time. Why don't you sit down and have an earnest word with him? No way! To be embarrassed further? Anyway, there's something fishy about this whole story. Either Edward is acting like a complete fool, or else he hasn't truly understood what I feel for him. Oh, 
I need some clarity. From now on, I'm going to scrutinise his every move. Hi again and welcome back for some more English language. Did you hear Alice talking about her regrets? Do you know that regrets, when you do something you wish you hadn't done, that's a regret? Well, there are different ways to express that in the English language. She said, I wish I hadn't written that card. I shouldn't have written that card. That's another possibility. There are, in fact, three possibilities in English of, re of expressing regret. And I want to look at those with you. Because they're quite complicated, let's do it together on the screen, all right? Now, the first example is with should. Now, you know should. Should we use, for example, you should rest when you give advice. But if we put it into a past form, we use it to express regret. So the grammatical structure is should plus the infinitive have plus the past participle. So an example is, imagine, it's raining. I haven't got my umbrella and you want to express a regret. So you could say, I should have brought my umbrella. You see, should, infinitive, have, plus the past participle, bring, brought, brought. So you say, oh, damn, I should have brought my umbrella with me. So that's one example of expressing regret using should, should have brought. The second example is with wish. So it's raining and you think, oh, damn, I wish. Now the grammatical form is, I wish I had brought. That is the past perfect. Had is the auxiliary of have in the past, then the past participle. So I wish I had brought my umbrella with me. So I should have brought. I wish I had brought. And the last one is very similar to wish. It's if only I had brought my umbrella with me. So there again we have if only followed by the past perfect. If only I had brought my umbrella with me. All right, so three forms of expressing regrets. Let's practice. Situation, I've got sunstroke. My face is burning because I've been on the beach all day. Regrets could be, I shouldn't have stayed in the sun so long. Shouldn't have stayed. I wish I hadn't stayed in the sun so long. If only I hadn't stayed. Get the idea? Yeah? Good. Next situation. My car has broken down again. It stopped. My car's broken down again. Regret. I should have taken it to the mechanics. I should have taken it to the mechanic earlier for a checkup. Or I wish I had taken it. You see, you can use one of the three forms, exactly the same meaning, all right? Great. Next one, I'm completely lost. Situation, I am completely lost. Regret. I wish I had brought a map with me. I wish I had brought a map with me. Okay, getting the idea? Next one, I've got a terrible headache. Oh, terrible headache. If only I hadn't drunk, drink, drank, drunk, so much red wine last night. If only I hadn't. I shouldn't have drunk three bottles of red wine last night. Now I regret it. <laughs> Another one. Damn, I missed the plane. I missed the plane. 
my alarm clock. Bzzz. I should have put the alarm clock on. <laughs> Obviously. And the last one, my pink card. I'm trying to get money. <clears throat> I've forgotten my pink card for my cash dispenser card. <gasps> I should have memorized it better. If only I had memorized it better. All right, so there are the three forms. Should have done, I wish I had done, and if only I had done. Okay, I'm sure you think, I wish I had been born English. That way, I wouldn't have to learn the English language. Well, we're here to help you. So that's the end of this lesson and see you again very soon. Bye. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Music World. And of course, welcome to our music expert, Tony Moore. Hello, Lucy. And good morning to all our music fans. A great cultural icon with a very difficult recent history. A popular TV programme broadcasting these problems to a whole nation. And today, great performances to packed houses. I'm talking about the Royal Opera House at Covent Garden in London. The theatre dates back to 1732, but recently it's become more famous than ever. What exactly has been happening at the Royal Opera, Tony? Well, Everything started with the restoration work that was begun in 1995. Uh, this work is now being completed and we have the modern performance space that it is today. I can't see any trouble there. <laughs> sure, but uh, the restoration work was partly funded by the National Lottery. What do you mean partly funded? How much money came from the lottery? The lottery gave £58.5 million pounds towards the work. Quite a lot of money. Remind me how the lottery works. Lottery tickets cost one pound and are sold all over the country. And there's a big draw once a week. OK, so the Royal Opera House received 58.5 million pounds from the lottery. What happened next? The restoration work was completed in 1999. Tony Blair's Labour government uh, had given the Royal Opera this lottery money on condition that it made opera less elitist in the future by keeping some of its seats reasonably priced for citizens earning an average wage. Did they do that? Yes, but let's not rush things. In 2001, the Royal Opera became even more famous when the BBC filmed a fly-on-the-wall documentary about the day-to-day -day running of the place. Well, the programme showed a real-life soap opera in action. During this period, the theatre was chaotically managed and was almost out of control. Five executive directors left in the space of five years. There was ongoing conflict between management and employees, and the Royal Opera suddenly found itself at the centre of a political debate about the funding of the arts in the UK. Many people asked whether opera wasn't too elitist an art form to receive funding from the government. Why? Is the running of the Royal Opera completely funded by the government? No, uh, but it does rely in part on the government. 31% of its funds come from government subsidies. Today, corporate sponsorship is becoming more important. In 2006, this amounted to nearly £16 million. Of course, the rest of the funds come from ticket sales. I see. And then, how does the story end? Oh, the BBC documentary programme was a great success. It had a huge audience. Uh, the TV project wasn't so successful for the Royal Opera management as it entered a period of financial crisis and there was an enormous amount of criticism because of the high costs of the renovation work and because of the BBC TV documentary, which showed that the place was managed very, very badly. And today? Well, after so many years of difficult times, the Royal Opera is newsworthy simply because it isn't. 
for the last five years, the Royal Opera has been putting on successful operas and ballets. It's been doing a fine job. But what's more, the Opera House has kept its promise. Now, it's attracting new audiences to listen to opera, and some of the seats are reasonably priced. So, how much do tickets cost? The top price for performance is usually £180. But half of the seats cost £50 or less. Well, the cheaper seats cost less than £10. Of course, they're, they're not very close to the stage, but they are the cheapest grand opera seats in Europe. On an average evening, 48% of the audience is watching its first opera. So, a wider range of people are watching opera now in London. Oh, that's right. After a very difficult period, the Royal Opera is now running smoothly. Another soap opera with a happy ending. So, thanks, Tony, and thanks. goodbye. Goodbye. And goodbye to all our music fans. So, the Royal Opera House, a cultural icon with a difficult history. A cultural icon is a famous symbol for one of the arts, music, writing or painting. But today it puts on performances to packed houses. Remember, the phrasal verb to put on means to organise and perform. A packed house is a theatre with every seat sold out. We say a place is packed when it's full of people. The restoration work that started in 1995 was partly funded by the National Lottery. To be funded by means to be financed by, to receive money from someone or something, in this case, the lottery. It was partly funded means that it received part of the money it needed. This money was given on condition that opera was made less elitist. Elitist means that it is only available to a small group of people, usually socially or intellectually superior. The expression on condition that means only if. The BBC filmed a fly on the wall documentary about the day to day running of the place. A fly on the wall documentary is a program that shows everything that happens in real life situations. Day to day means daily, of every day. So the day to day running of the place means the normal, everyday administration of the place. This real life soap opera showed the theatre was almost out of control. A soap opera is a TV programme with many episodes that looks at the day-to-day -day lives of a group of people. Out of control means there is no control, like chaotic or disorganised. It showed the ongoing conflict between managers and employees. A conflict is a disagreement. It was ongoing means that it continued for a long period of time. That's all we have time for today. See you again soon. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Travel Programme. In the studio with me once again is Christine Oteng, our travel expert. Good morning, everyone. Well, what does the word holiday conjure up in your mind? White sand beaches, beautiful blue sea and fantastic seafood? Or maybe cool mountain air and invigorating walks through alpine forests? How about this? Think helping to build a dam outside a village in Uganda. Think helping out in a rural hospital in India. Think showing visitors round a castle in England. That's right, today's travel topic is volunteer holidays, a way to travel and do good at the same time. Am I right, Christine? Right. A volunteer holiday can be a true life-changing experience. Travel visit new places and help local people at the same time. It's a great way to really make contact with local people, their culture and the kinds of problems they face, and you can help in a small way to solve some of those problems. Certainly a holiday with a difference. What sorts of places have volunteer holidays? There are two kinds of volunteer holidays, really. A lot of these holidays take place in developing countries, in Africa, India and sometimes in South America. Other holidays can be found in Europe and North America. So there are lots of destinations to choose from. 
and what sorts of things can you do? There's an enormous range of activities to choose from. In the developing world, a lot of the work is based around helping on infrastructure projects, so you may help to dig a new well or build a new footbridge or perhaps a children's playground. Or you may decide to help out in a local hospital or in an orphanage. All sorts of useful projects to improve the daily lives of local people in small ways. And what about the work in developed countries? Well, here the work is slightly different. It's usually for charitable organisations, like, for example, the National Trust, an English charity that looks after many castles and old houses. It also owns many areas of beautiful countryside. Anyway, it's possible to do lots of interesting things for the National Trust. What, for example? As you mentioned earlier, helping to show tourists round a castle in the summer there is a beautiful 15th century castle on an island off the northeast coast of England, Lindisfarne Castle. Well, they're looking for a couple to do this job for a fortnight. OK, I'll think about that. But do you have to pay for these activities? Yes, of course you have to pay. Volunteer holidays in developing countries tend to cost more because travel costs are higher and some of your money will go to help the local community. In this way, you help poor people twice. Just one question, Christine. During volunteer holidays, do you have to work all the time? Well, usually there's a split between volunteer work and sightseeing. For example, during a fortnight's holiday to Africa, you may spend the first week on your volunteer work and the second week visiting game reserves, relaxing, shopping the sorts of things you normally do on holiday. Good. So, you have time for fun too. OK, everyone, the next time you're trying to decide where to go on holiday, forget the beaches, forget the mountains, and start thinking about leaving your comfort zone for Africa or the English countryside. Thanks, Christine, for that fascinating information. Goodbye. And, of course, goodbye to all travellers. Well, what does the word holiday conjure up in your mind? What does it conjure up? Means, what does it make you think of? What do you imagine when you hear the word holiday? A volunteer holiday can be a life-changing experience. A life-changing experience means it changes your life. There are two kinds of volunteer holidays, in developing countries and in developed countries. A developing country is a country with a low level of economic activity and low standards of living, like India and Africa. All these countries together are called the developing world. European countries are developed countries. There are lots of destinations to choose from. There are lots to choose from means that there is a big selection. There are lots of activities to choose from. You can help on an infrastructure project, a project that involves building or construction. You can help to build a footbridge, a bridge for people to cross on foot. You can help out in an orphanage. An orphanage is a home for children who have lost their parents. Notice how we say help to do something, help on a project and help out in a place. You could also work for a charitable organisation in a developed country. A charitable organisation is an organisation whose aim is not to make a profit but to help people in need. For example, you could spend a fortnight showing tourists around a castle in England. A fortnight is a period of 14 days. They're looking for a couple to do this job. A couple is two people, usually a man and a woman, who are married or in a relationship together. OK, well, that's all for this week, so take care and study hard. <laughs>